So all of those 28 were on the subject of artificial intelligence. So some people use artificial intelligence. One of them was actually for agriculture, the use of artificial intelligence for better quality agricultural output. So the team in which I took part, it was a very unique concept. This was about the use of artificial intelligence to support immigration throughout the world. So for example, you are a student in India and let us say you would like to explore in which countries you could go abroad and pursue your studies. Let's say you are already a doctor in India, but you would like to know where you could go and what kind of visas you will be required to work as a doctor. Let us say you are somebody who is a parent of one of the sons or daughter who is settled with a green card in the US. You would like to know about the formalities that are required to be completed. And therefore, each one of you, each one of the immigrants, whether they are in India or in Kenya or in other countries, everybody will have the challenge of knowing what exactly needs to be done. And what we were proposing in the startup idea was to use artificial intelligence to understand the government regulations across all of the world to make it happen. And I will just give you one simple difficulty. You will say, I can go to the Google, I can go to internet, I, I can go to government website and do this myself. Why do I need artificial intelligence for that? I live in London. So the UK government's website has 700,000 pages. So I can tell you that it's not going to be easy for anyone to go and find out everything. And therefore, our idea was to use artificial intelligence to help the immigration, the prospective immigration candidates and their families and dependents throughout the world. We presented this idea and we got the first prize. And I'm very proud that it was, um, uh, it was uh, found very useful because of two, three reasons. One, because I have immigrated myself. So I moved from India. I went to France. I lived in France. From France, I was moving to Moscow in Russia. I did not go there, but I had completed the formalities. Then I migrated to the UK. Then I migrated to Belgium. And from Belgium, I came back to London in the UK. Yeah. And because I was one of the seven founders of this startup who was through the immigration experience, not just me, all the other six were also immigrants. Okay. And we knew that when we do this business, we are putting our heart and soul into it because it is so close and personal to us. Just the way your friend shared that she would like to start a clinic because that is close to her heart. Therefore, I would suggest that let us not try to copy paste what is the fashion of the world today. Rather, let us discuss and let us pursue what is close to your heart. And only in that case, you will be so immersed in making it successful that your chances of success will increase significantly. Okay, so I'm not going to speak for long, but firstly, if you agree with me, can you raise your hand? Students, can you hear me? If you agree with me, raise your hand. All right. Now, anybody who does not agree with me, please raise your hand. Okay, that is fine. But I'm happy even for you to disagree with me, okay? So don't think that because I'm speaking, I know everything. No, I do not know everything, but I'm always a student for the rest of my life. Okay, I was a formal student when, like Babu Shankar, we studied together. And even today, after 34 years, I will myself call a student because I'm learning every day. I just need to learn. Everybody needs to learn. 
And this is where we have to be open to accept a different idea, a different challenge from somebody else. Now, let's start with the next question uh, from the girl who is holding the microphone. Can you stand up? I'll ask you a question. Uh, the, the next one, we'll give it to on somebody else. Yeah. Please stand up. Don't be shy, come on, take the microphone, just stand up. Okay, can you hear me? Wonderful, I'm going to ask you a question, okay. Let us say, we will start a new business and this business is going to be about creating waterproof shoes for farmers, okay? Let's say we are going to start a completely new business for waterproof shoes for farmers so that when they work in the fields, they are safe, okay? What is it that you will need as the startup founder? What do you need? Money? Okay. You will get the capital. But even before you get the capital, what is it that you will need? Before I give you my money as capital, will you need to show me something? Will you need to give me a plan, business plan or something? Right. Okay, so let us talk a little bit about business plan. Thank you. You can sit down. Let us talk about before we ask anybody for money for our startup, how do we convince them? What is the basis on which somebody will have that confidence in us and give us the money? Because there are lots of people with lots of ideas throughout the world. Ideas are cheap, successful, okay, successful businesses are few. So what is the difference between those businesses who are supported by financiers? I was also a director of the BNP Paribas Group where we're doing venture capital investment. Okay, again, we had lots of proposals. We had to be very selective on where we put our money. So having a good business plan is absolute must. So what I would suggest is when you were to think about your own business, start putting some ideas on paper. It doesn't have to be Excel Word. You can choose what you want, but start putting down the ideas as if you're going to explain to me that Santosh, I would like to get 10 lakh rupees from you for my business of waterproof shoes for farmers. This is my business plan. And the business plan will need to say, what is the consumer needing? Okay, you have to first establish why does the farmer need a waterproof shoe? So you start with the basic need. Then you can explain in technology terms, what is the material that you're going to use to create the shoes? Then you do a financial plan. You say, what is the cost of my raw material? What is the cost of my labor? Do I need to write? A, do I need to create a new factory? So you're going to take these steps and ultimately you will create what is called as the pitch. Okay, The word pitch includes the story. You will be able to say something that we have so many crore farmers in India. Their fields have sometimes snakes, Sometimes there's too much of water. Okay, sometimes there are thorns. Okay, and some of these farmers are not even having proper shoes. And therefore, in order to make their life easy, if you decide I want to create the shoes business, I will create shoes where I will be selling the shoes for 500 rupees one pair, and my cost of production is 250 rupees per pair. Distribution cost, let's say, are another 100. And therefore, my profit margin is going to be 150 rupees per pair of waterproof shoes. This is how you start selling your ideas to the potential investor. 
Okay. So, if this part is clear, can you raise your hand so that I know that you got the concept? Yeah, I can see the hands are going up. So, on the pitch part, okay, I think you, you got it. Now, the question is, people, okay? It is very important to have a good team when you start your own business. So this is where your contribution to the society starts. Okay, You are going to get other like-minded people. You might be a group of three students to coming together to start your business. One person doing the technology part, one person doing the finance part, one person doing maybe the marketing part. Okay, So you will need a team of people. Some people will be like you, co-founders, and some people are going to actually be the people who you will be hiring. Okay, so your first contribution to the society is going to be when you hire people, you are generating employment. Okay. And whether you are a huge group like Tata Industries or whether you are a very small group of 10 employees, okay, that does not matter. You are going to start small. It is very important to really take that view that when we do any business, we are contributing to the society. Okay, We are not talking about trading here. Is doing a day trading where taking a speculative position in Nifty in the morning and hoping that it will go up and in the evening selling it and making a profit or, or crying because it went down. That is not really addition of value to the economy, to the society. The real addition is when you create a difference to the society by creating good products and by actually generating employment. So let us go to the next student and uh, please pass the microphone to the next student and I'm going to ask one more question. All right, fine. My question to you is going to be very simple. Let us say you start a business, okay? And you start selling products online, okay? So you are going to have a website where people will visit. You will be advertising your website, maybe on television or something. And people are going to come and they're going to put basically their orders to your website. Please tell me, what are the risks of running a website for your business? When you have a business and that is a website, what is the risk of running a website? Okay, I'll help you there. Okay. Will you will you take the payment using credit card on your website? Yeah. So when you accept a credit card, and if that website is hacked, will there be a problem for your business? Yeah. Okay, you can have a seat. So what we are talking about now, okay, is called the cyber risk. Okay, and cyber is, is basically that your business, its data, its information can be stolen, it can be destroyed, and also the customer information like credit card that you are collecting, that can fall into wrong hands, that criminals can take, okay? This means that you will need to pay attention whether you are a small company or a big company, when you start your online business, you think about how can I make my website and my business secure, okay? Now, why I'm giving higher importance to cybersecurity, let me share with you. Now, experience shows that more than two thirds of the small businesses which have a cyber attack in the year or two years that follow the cyber attack, they get completely bankrupt. 
So you don't want to have a situation where you have actually started a business, you hired people, you started producing, you are starting to take orders, you got a good customer base, you got a good reputation. You got a really nice reputation as a clinic or you got a nice reputation as a shoe manufacturer and you get hacked. What you do want is your years of effort getting completely wasted because after a cyber attack, there is a high probability that your business will go bankrupt. Your customers will lose faith in you. The regulators are going to be upset with you and you might be having some fines. You will need to appoint somebody to do the investigation for you. That is not free. That will cost a lot of money. So all of this thing you have to bear in mind when you are running a business. Okay. This means that what we need to be aware of as a business person is about risk management. Business is not about being able to show that I can make money. It is about being able to show that you can manage the risk, you understand the risk. Of course, you can hire professional risk managers. I don't have a problem with that. You can get specialists, but you will be hiring a risk manager only when you understand the importance of risk management. Otherwise, you will not hire somebody. Okay, so this is basically meaning that as students, we start to learn about risk management right now. And cyber risk is just one type of risks. Okay, there are a large number of risks. For example, you got liquidity risk, having the cash. Okay, investment risk, because you made money, you saved some money and you are making investments. You will have market risk, which is affecting the volatility of in your investments and liabilities. You will have operational risk. It might be IT risk or it might be just a simply your business or the factory in which you produce your shoes that might burn now. Okay, so operational risk. So risk management, therefore, needs to be taught. It needs to be learned. You don't need to go to large classes or something, but you need to learn about risk management because when you start learning about risk management, you are just going to say that I'm going to make profit. This is my business. But for my business, there are certain risks. Do I understand what the risks are? And can I reduce the risk? The English word for that is mitigation of risk. Okay, It's not about zero risk. There is nothing called zero risk in life. Being an entrepreneur, starting your own business is all about taking risk. Okay, So you would like to take the risk, but in a measured manner. You don't want to take indiscriminately any kind of risk and that is where you will be hiring people to work for you who are the professional risk managers who have studied risk management who understand risk okay let's raise the hands now who will be interested in risk management anybody would like to learn risk management i can see only a few hands and I'm not very happy to see that because risk management is a subject that personally I love and I see only few students raising their hands. Yeah. Okay, but that's fine. Thank you. You can lower your hands. But the important thing for me is please think about it. Okay, it's not about starting a business. It's making your business to continue, grow, prosper and become very successful. Now, why does Tata Industries, even after hundreds of years of existence, has been so successful? Think about it. It's not because Tata Steel was the only steel manufacturer in the country. No, they were not. In steel, we had Ispat Ningam and we had a huge number of steel manufacturers. Okay, Jindal Steel and others. So what made Tata Steel so profitable? and such a good company to work for, such a good company to invest in, think about how the successful business as you see today, the top companies in Nifty, in BAC Sensex, what makes them successful? And once you go into the understanding, it's not purely about their products. It is also about the way these companies are managing risk. Okay, And therefore, the lesson to be learned is we should be mindful of risk management, okay? Now, fine, we are at 36 past uh, my time. What I'm going to do is I'm now going to 
open for interaction with you and i would like you to ask me questions when you speak please hold the microphone close to your mouth so as if you are putting it on your chin so that your voice will be loud and i'll be able to hear you so i'm going to take a few questions from you and in interacting with you i'm going to answer your questions so if you can pass the microphone to the next row behind you anybody who would like to ask question from the next row who would like to ask me a question So am I audible? Yes, I can hear you very well. And thank you for asking the question. What are the skills are required for risk management? While managing the risk, what skill we should have? Okay, that's a good question. You, you can keep the microphone with you because we're going to have that thing, uh, that exchange now. Your question is very good. I'm going to help you think about it now. Okay, let us say you and me started a new business. Okay, and we started a new business which is all about replacing the condensers in air conditioners to make them more power friendly, power efficient. Okay, so we get rid of the old aluminum condensers in air conditioners and we replace them with good quality pure copper condensers and so that the electricity bill which is already very high for people these days and especially in month of may april may when they when it's very hot the bills are too high let's say we start that business now my question to you is we buy copper condensers and let's say our business is successful. We require, every month, we require one lakh condensers. What is the risk that you and me are going to face in our business? Can you identify that? The users may not purchase our condenser or they will not allow us to replace their condensers. Correct. So one, one is the demand risk or the commercial risk. Yes. Okay. So we will, we will need to hire good quality distribution managers, regional networks, maybe local servicing people, marketing people. We'll have to do advertising campaign. So sure. the skills required for marketing, the commercial activity are going to be very important for that particular risk that you just described. That is the marketing risk or commercial risk. We require professionals. But let's sure. focus on the business that we have. We talked about copper condensers. Do you realize that our profitability will be less or more based on the price of the copper itself? Yes, sir. We should get more profits. Okay. Right. But if the we are buying copper, okay? So if the price of the copper goes down, our profit margin will go down. We will make losses. Okay. So one way to think about it is we have something called the commodity price risk, the copper prices. Okay, so how do we manage the risk? First is understanding the risk. So we now understand that we have a risk to the commodity price, which is the copper price. But then we are, what we are going to do is the following. We are going to see what are the mechanisms available to reduce the risk that we face. And this can be done through different ways. For example, commodity trading or commodity finance products, which are about, let's say, the options on buying copper, or doing forward trades by doing a fixed price. These are the financial instruments that can be used to reduce the risk. So again, you see there is a combination of knowledge of finance, which is about understanding the instruments available to reduce the copper price risk and our business, understanding the risk. So hopefully these two examples that we saw give you the answer of what skills we need the first skill that we saw in both these examples is to identify what the risk is. And secondly, know what are the best mechanisms to mitigate the risk. And this is a such a universal thing that even if we are talking about 
any other risk. It's exactly the same approach we take. Understand the risk and find out the best way to manage the risk. For example, in our factory, let us say we got 10 people who are sick because of COVID. Okay. How are you going to manage the risk? We'll allocate the, them beds. Yeah, correct. So you are going to reduce the risk by looking after the health of the people who are working for you. Okay. Yes. So again, each of these problems will have a unique solution. And you will have to select when there are more solutions, you will have to select which one you, which solution you like the most. Which so one is efficient, we'll select that one only. Correct. Very good. So I think we got a good understanding, both of us, that what we are going to do if it was our business. Okay. So if you are happy with the answer, can we check if somebody else wants to ask another question? Sure, sir. Yeah. Sure. Anybody else wants to ask a question? Hello, sir. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Good afternoon, sir. So my question to you would be like if if we are in the risk management of if we are in the business, so it's, uh, like but obvious that we will need investors. So what will be those smart ideas or potential ideas to attract in investors into our startup? Like how do we tackle that risk? Okay. Can you hold the microphone close to your chin? Don't move it like this. Keep it there and ask your question again because I can't hear Should you. I repeat it? Yes, please repeat. And now I can hear you much better. Okay. Thank you. So suppose we are into startups. Okay, so there is a major risk of will we get right investors or not? So how do we manage that risk of uh, attracting potential uh, investors? Okay, it's a very good question. Okay, And many times you will find that the dilemma that we'll have in our business is about chicken and egg. Okay, In order to get the investors, we need to have a brilliant idea. And in order to develop the idea into something concrete, we need money, so we need investors. So we have a bit of chicken and egg situation. So let us just create a new business idea, you and me. So let us say you and me start a new business, which is about uh, new yoga centers. Okay, so let us say we are going to create a yoga center in all of the cities in the state. Okay, and this the purpose of this yoga center is going to be making yoga training available to people, regardless of the age or their background, at a very, very cheap price. Okay, very affordable price. So, let us say that is our business. Okay, now. You and me want to get funding because we need to have the yoga mats, we need to get the yoga teachers, we need to pay their salary. And of course, if it's you know, if it's a yoga hall we are renting, we have to pay the rent. Okay. So this is where we need the money. So you and me, we are going to go to our first investor. Okay. And typically what happens is this is where we try to solve the chicken and exposition uh, problem. Okay. We can go to the providers of what is called the seed capital. So when something is at a small scale, where we want to just have the first two yoga classes, prove that it works fine, and then expand it to 20, and make it to 200, and then make it to 2,000. We don't need the same amount of money every time. You agree with me? So we can start small, and when we start small, when we go to the investor for the first time, we go with a small idea, we make a success of it, and then we go for what is called the round two funding, then the round three funding, or round four funding. Okay, and ultimately, when we reach a particular size, we don't need individual investors to support us. We can actually do what is called the IPO or the initial public offering, or issue our shares in the market, become a listed company on the exchange. Okay, so this is going to be a long term journey, it won't be immediately available. Okay. But if the idea is good, today, I find that in India, as well as in the UK, there are a lot of investors with a lot of money who are looking for ideas to invest in. Okay, They don't ask for huge amount of, you know, you don't have to show that you got already 10,000 centers of yoga. Even if you start with two and show them, yeah, it works fine. Yeah. So do you think this approach will work? That's my question to you. 
Yes, sir, definitely. If the investors get to know that, yes, our idea is good, or that they see a potential growth, they automatically, automatically get attracted. Correct. So our responsibility is to convince the people who are initially going to support us. And of course, I'm not asking you to go to your family and friends because, you know, every business has a risk. So you don't want to go to your grandmother and say, give me your money because why should she take the risk? That doesn't work. So what we need to do is really go for proper investors who are there as an investor, not because of relationship, because they're there because they believe in our product. So this is what we should do. All right. I'm going to take one more question. So can you pass on the... Yep. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Well. Um, sir, uh, I have a question which is uh, related to investors. Uh, most of the investors are uh, profit... Uh, we, we want profit, but uh, nowadays we need more sustainability. But if I'm going to start a business uh, which uh, is more about sustainability and not profit, how do I get funding? Okay. Okay, there is an assumption under your question. So let us unpick that. When you say sustainable business, are we talking about eco-friendly or environment-friendly business? Is that your assumption there? So mostly I know sustainable activities, like uh, taking out plastic and using, reusing that plastic, like, like those things. Okay. So let's say this is a business idea where we say we are going to be in the business of plastic recycling. Okay. Now, I can tell you that this business itself as an idea, it's not a loss making idea. Okay. You can make this business at the same time you are reducing the pollution because of plastic. Okay. By recycling and you will be in a position to attract investors. So, just because you are doing an activity which is classified as sustainable investment does not mean that it's a bad investment idea. Okay, so what we are trying to do here is we want to really come out of this mindset that anything which is eco-friendly will not be financeable. That is not true. In fact, you will see that there is a lot of money there in the world. Okay, with dedicated funds which are only for what is called the ESG, okay? So it is the ecological, okay, social and governance practices, ESG, environment, social and governance. So the ESG investment get a lot of money. So it's not impossible to get money for such projects. Obviously, what will not be possible is charity, okay? Obviously, charity's purpose is a different thing. It's not a business. There is a distinction between a business and a charity. So charity funding comes from different kinds of foundations and the investment funding comes from all different types of investors. So do you think, therefore, you and me start this business of plastic recycling? Do you think somebody will support us? Like-minded people are together, they will support each other. Sorry, I can't hear you. So if like-minded like people are together, they will support each other. Yeah. But the important thing is, it's not just about being like-minded. It is that we want people who understand that we can even convert plastic recycling into a profitable business. Okay. We are the entrepreneurs. We have to show to people that this is a profitable business. There is nothing wrong in being profit-oriented. Okay. Profit is not a bad word. Without profit, nobody is going to do the business. So let's take out the stigma. Profit orientation is a good thing. Only by making profitable business, people will support you to do bigger businesses. And therefore, we should not be greedy. There's a difference between being greedy and being profit oriented. By being profit oriented, we are helping our investors to have the confidence that the money that they are giving to you and me 
for our plastic recycling business so that money is well invested okay so hopefully you got the difference between being greedy and being profit oriented being profit oriented will make you responsible person yeah is that okay with you the distinction yeah yes sir wonderful all right so i'm just going to check my time i got another 10 minutes or more to speak with you so what's the best thing would you like to ask me a few more questions yes sir all right i'm waiting for your question my first question sir <clears throat> what a strategy do you suggest uh, to reduce the risk strategy to reduce risk yes, okay sir. okay as i mentioned you cannot make the risk as zero okay there were all this some risk so what you need to do is you need to determine how much risk you are willing to take okay yes so the technical name for that is called risk appetite okay so when let us say you start a company or you start a partnership you will need to agree with your partners on what is the maximum risk you are willing to take okay so that's the theoretical answer let let's make it very practical do you have any business idea then we'll discuss that any business idea that you would like to start a business no sir i have no idea sir okay if i give you some money and i say okay i'm giving 5 lakh rupees you start any business of your choice which business will you put your money in oh, sir transportation sir wonderful okay so you will take 5 lakh rupees and you will buy maybe a vehicle or something like that or you will do some transport related business okay so let us talk about the risk in the transport business let's say we start with only one car okay we buy one car we hire a driver okay so driver basically is uh, taking uh, people here and there okay and per kilometer you as a business owner you are making money okay so the risk is that your car will have an accident the driver will have an accident right how will you protect yourself against the risk of your car which is your business property having a damage due to accident how will you protect yourself with insurance sir insurance exactly security. that's right you see so your question to me was how do i reduce my risk i'm helping you to think about once you understand what the risk is there you know what products are there to reduce the risk insurance is one way to reduce the risk yes okay so again you will need to really be aware of what kind of risks are there is it liquidity risk is it credit risk is it market risk so when you look at any risk management book you will see all of this thing just as a menu but really when we start thinking from this business person's perspective we need to really make it lively and know if it's a car it can have an accident okay if it's a factory the factory can burn down if it is employees they can fall sick so we need to therefore think about each and everything that is used in our business whether it's a person or a property or any kind of other scientific method that's used that has a risk and we need to identify what is the risk there yeah so do you think our car uh, will be safer by buying an insurance policy yes okay wonderful do you have any other questions or do you want to give yes. it to somebody yes, else sir. yes sir yeah <clears throat> what are what are some of the most common types of uh, cyber attack okay wonderful question um it changes okay so let us say what is it that the cyber criminal is trying to do okay so let us just understand that and let's talk about a completely different business now let us say you and me get into a business of printing aadhar cards okay we get the contract from the government and we get you and me start a new business of printing other cards which are really nicely laminated other cards okay with logo and hologram and let's say that's our new business okay and we got information about all of the indian citizens what is the cyber criminal going to be trying to do to our business sir personal data sir is like uh, aadhar number correct so they're going to steal the information right okay so cyber criminals first thing that they want is they want to steal your data 
The second thing they will try to do is they try to basically destroy your server so that your servers can no longer be used. Okay. Some of the things they have a technical name called ransomware or destructive ransomware attack, but these are different things. For example, if you have, have you ever had a situation where the university results are going to be declared, okay? And everybody wants to go to the website of the university and find out, oh, did I get my admission or not? Or did I pass the exam or not? And then the site stops working. Have you seen that happening? Yes, when sir. too many people try to go to the same website, the site stops working. The criminal also can do exactly the same thing by sending a lot of traffic to your server. And that is called the DDoS attack or distributed denial of service attack. Okay, so cyber criminals do not have only one way to attack you, depending on what you have, okay, whether you have personal data or whether you have monetary transactions or whether you have something else, which is like exam results, they will try to attack you where it hurts you the most. And this is where when we try to prepare for cybersecurity, we need to think what is called as the threat scenario. When the other card business you and me did, we had a scenario of data theft. When we talked about university, okay, we are talking about DDoS attack as threat. Okay, so does that help you get uh, to the bottom of what kind of cyber attacks are there? I think I lost you in terms of connection. Let's go back to Babu Shankar. Babu, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, I think the student in the other uh, campus, he lost his connection. We could not speak with him. But hopefully, I completed the answer to his question. Second, man, uh, we are not able to hear you speak from there. Can you hear this now? Sorry, sir. No, it's okay. That's all right. I think, did you hear the last pass of part of my answer to you about cyber risk? Yeah? All right. Can you check if any other student wants any question? Otherwise, I'll come back to the main campus. Good afternoon, sir. My question to you that what is the operational risk that I have to wear if I want to start a business? Okay, operational risk, very good question. Okay, let's discuss this. Um, give me one business idea that we will do as a business together. What business would you like to do? Sir, like pharmacy. Okay. So you and me would like to start a new pharmacy. Okay, yes. so let us do that. Let's think further. What's so special about our pharmacy? There are so many pharmacies already there. What is new about our pharmacy? Tell me. Give me some business ideas. Like, sir, uh, there is a lots of chemical and that use in the medicine. medicine. Yeah. So, in, in the current scenario, everyone wants to arsenic, like for, from the plants and everything okay. we want to use in our uh, medical. So, that is my business that I have to use the, the natural resource in the uh, medicine that is helpful for the women's that is my idea sir very nice what's your name my name is Shraddha Sujata sir Shraddha Sujata your business idea is brilliant okay thank you sir okay let us now think about the operational risk in your business which is actually using organic products to create beauty products for women and men okay yes. so let's so if we are doing this business let us say we are manufacturing our products and we are selling them, okay? So both manufacturing, selling, and we might even have a shop in which we are selling it. That's, that's perfectly fine. One of the things that happens is we might have a situation where we buy very good quality organic products, but let us say that gets contaminated because of chemicals, right? So this is a problem with our process because our process might mix chemicals when it should not be mixing, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
So that brings me to the basic definition. When you go to your book and you will check the definition of operational risk, you will see that operational risk is a loss due to the failure of people, processes, systems, or third parties we use. Okay, so let us go into this definition. This is a theoretical definition. In real life, what will happen? Third parties. Of course, you and me are not growing the organic tulsi in our backyard. We are purchasing it from somebody. So the third party may sell us contaminated tulsi, right? Exactly. So we, our operational risk therefore depends on that third party. Likewise, we saw that the process, our plant, which does a lot of products, it might mix chemicals by mistake. So the process may be a failure. So when you and me want to manage the operational risk in this business of organic beauty products, we will need to make sure that our people are properly trained, our processes are good quality processes, our systems and vessels that we use for creating these products are really properly cleaned, and our sellers who sell us things, for example, giving us tulsi, or somebody might giving us jest mud, somebody might be giving us turmeric, because turmeric is one of the ingredients for really good quality beauty products, okay? Or chandan, okay? So all of these inputs that we use, we need to ensure that the supply chain is solid so that we don't buy by mistake weak products. We need to have also quality control. So operational risk looks like a theoretical topic, but in real life, when we manage operational risk, we are actually managing the business risk. Okay. Yes. So hopefully your business of organic beauty products, Shraddha Sujata, is going to be a very successful business. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, let's go back to uh, Babu Shankar in the main campus. Sir, one more question from the main campus. So, what is the greatest fear when it comes to risk management? Greatest fear when it comes to risk management. <laughs> I like the question. I've not thought about this before. So, thank you for asking such a nice question. Let me think about it and share with you what comes to my mind first. Okay, let us discuss this. Give me your business idea and then we'll develop in terms of which is the biggest fear in risk management. What is your business idea? So in the interior designer. Wonderful. Okay, so you want to do a business of interior design and we are talking about the risk management. Okay. Let us just say you and me accept a contract for interior design with somebody who is really uh, somebody who has bought a very, very big house. Okay. But the house is in a very bad condition. It requires a lot of renovation. It requires a lot of structural improvements. Let us say we take the contract. And we say, we'll do this interior design for your house, which includes the work in improving the structural foundation of your house, okay? Now, tell me, we agreed that this contract price is 20 lakh rupees. What is the risk that you and me are taking? And it's a fixed price contract, 20 lakh rupees. What is the risk that you and me are taking? If it's 20 lakh rupees, it is not probably... We can do it in only 20 lakh rupees. It will be more than 20 lakh. Correct. And therefore, what had just happened is we underestimated the risk. We underestimated the cost that is required to actually make this interior design completely delivered. And we misestimated, underestimated the cost of that renovation that was required. And therefore, instead of 20 lakh, Maybe we should have actually quoted in our contract 30 lakh rupees because the actual work that was required because the wall is breaking down or maybe you know there are some problems because the windows are completely broken. It requires a full replacement. Okay, So in the risk management, this is just one example. The biggest fear 
I would say for me as a risk manager would be ignoring some things which I should have looked at. So if I if I'm in this business and if I make the mistake of ignoring things that not doing a proper calculation of how much it's going to cost me and you, I would be doing a mistake. I'll be a bad risk manager. Okay. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the fear is figure fear of ignorance. Fear of miscalculation. That would be as a risk manager. Nobody is telling you that you cannot take risk, but please take calculated risk. So the difference between a successful risk manager and an unsuccessful risk manager is this difference. Taking risk which are not calculated risk. Taking a contract of 20 lakh rupees, not really calculating correctly that the cost of construction itself is going to be 30 lakh rupees. Okay. Does that give you a good answer to your question? Yes, sir. Right. One more question is there. Sorry? What is your experience with developing and implementing risk management process? I didn't get your question. Hold the microphone to your chin, please. So what is your experience with developing and implementing risk management process? Okay. My experience goes back many years, but I'll pick one example, which I really liked. This was back in 2004 when that time I was working in France and I moved to the UK. Our business was the insurance business. We were an insurance company. And the UK insurance business did not have a proper structure around risk management. Okay. So I went from France to start a risk management. I was the head of risk management there to start the processes of everything linked to risk management. It was not just creating documents and processes. It was more complicated because I had to look into also what is called the capital modeling of risk. How much capital should be held by the insurance company because of the risk that it carries. And this meant that I had to quantify the capital requirement of the company for operational risk, credit risk, market risk, as well as liquidity risk. So that was quite a challenging job. And yeah, I enjoyed doing that. So my experience was basically building a risk practice from scratch. All right. I think we are across one hour already. Babu Shankar, do you want me to continue or are we happy to say goodbye now? It's It's been a pleasure to interact with all of your students. There are some nice questions. They gave some nice answers. Some business ideas were really good quality ideas as well. I like them. Any more queries from uh, PKD campus? And uh, Vijay Nagaran? Sir, I don't have any question, but I would like to give a compliment to Sir. So he's the coolest CEO. Because when we talk about risk, risk management, these are all strong words which scare us. So today he has made it very simple. So I would like to express uh, gratitude uh, from uh, on behalf of my students. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Pragyama. Any queries from uh, AP campus? Meanwhile, you are there. Okay, okay, Santosh, I am not able to get any queries from there, and I cannot see anybody behind me raising their hands. Anybody from Bhuvaneshwar? I think I have been between them and lunch. Maybe that's why. Right. Thanks, Santosh. Thanks a lot for the time. You said, and uh, before I get into the formal thanks, anything from your side you want to share? I think it's it's been a pleasure to engage with the young talent who have ideas, who would like to make 
make a difference to the society in which we live. Some of the questions that we're asked is, how do we get our funding? They are very valid questions. And all I can say is that if there is a brilliant idea you have, if something that you are passionately committed to make a success of, if you have like-minded people to support you, maybe initially somebody may refuse to give you funding, but you should not stop there. Pursue with your dream and I'm sure you will be the first of the 28 ideas when you go to pitch your own startup ideas. So thank you for having me with you. One more last query. Two or three minutes about both your kids. I mean, you mentioned that both of them are job creators and not the job creators. How do they do? Oh, uh, my son is uh, in the business of wealth management. Uh, so he has just hired people to work for him in terms of both uh, the research as well as marketing. So I think he has got a team uh, now. And my daughter also is in the business of uh, digital uh, technology, or basically it's more into databases. And she's doing very well. And she just created a new company. And that new company is also hiring people. So what they're doing is, of course, they joined these companies as an analyst, the basic person, but eventually they're grown in the organization and they're really uh, hiring people for growing the business further. And particularly for my daughter, I'm very proud of her because she's, uh, uh, she's the brain behind the startup of her company. So it was already a company which has started a subsidiary, a new company, which my daughter is actually the creator of the product. And she is also, hopefully, one day she will be the chief operating officer of the company and she is hiring people. So I, I guess, you know, the, the whole thing is, uh, it's not trading. We are talking about creating jobs, creating value, creating products for the society. Thank you. So, so, Dr. Dipti, so really it's a wonderful session and uh, I'm sure that my students enjoy a lot, they learn a lot and the way they put the question to you, the way you deal with them, it's really, we all enjoy it and we are hope for more and more sessions from you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. All right, everybody, thank you very much. I will see you soon. Thank you. Bye now.